All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm uh, broadcasting in from Denver, Colorado, and we have an exciting session for you today. So I'm, I'm really excited by the amount of people um, that have um, signed in to join us and also the specific discussion um, that we're going to have that is um, centered on glaucoma drainage devices. Um, I'm going to start off by doing an intro uh, that is pretty basic. And then I'm going to pass it on to our first speaker, Maria Delgado. And um, after that, we're going to go to Nate Radcliffe um, to um, get us through some of the basics of glaucoma surgery and then through some advanced techniques that Dr. Radcliffe will share with us. If we have some time uh, between the sessions and between the videos, we'll go through some questions. So please um, send in your, your questions to the um, chat room that you can see um, on the system. And um, at the end, we'll also try and leave some question and answer time. Uh, we'll try and get through as much as possible in about an hour and a half or so. Um, so again, I'm Malik Cahook. I'm a professor of ophthalmology from the uh, University of Colorado. Um, I am a glaucoma surgeon and cataract surgeon. And um, I've had a great time really participating in these point to points that we started with um, CyberSight, just a few. I think this is our third one at this point. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, Point to Point is a, is a series that we're running uh, that is intended to be more discussional. So colleagues, friends getting on uh, Zoom and, and having a discussion about all things glaucoma related. It's also intended to be more question and answer intensive. Uh, in my past talks with CyberSight and with Orbis, we haven't had as much time for question and answer. So we're going to try and do that more and more specifically with Point to Point. I'm putting my, my Twitter and Instagram handles here so you can send me some thoughts that you have on what we can cover in future point to points. Um, this, is, uh, this session in particular came from an audience uh, member suggestion. So please keep that up uh, and I'll um, do my best to incorporate as many of these suggestions as possible. I also want to make sure that you're aware of CyberSight, cybersight.org. The educational resources on CyberSight are tremendous. Um, there are basic lecture series. One in particular by Lee Allward from Iowa is excellent. He goes over many of the steps for glaucoma diagnosis and follow-up. Um, I put up an educational um, uh, link, keogt.com, that has everything from basics of glaucoma through surgical videos that you can follow. You can also get consults on CyberSight, and there's an AI capability that allows you to upload your photos, optic nerve head and fundus photos, um, to get an idea of um, what you might be seeing if you're a little bit confused about the optic nerve head and what the cup to disc ratio might be. And I think that's a resource you can explore. Um, I want to thank the Orbis team for helping organize this, and congrats to Derek Hodke, who's uh, the new CEO who's running Orbis. So exciting times for, for Orbis in general. Um, I'll do a quick intro here for uh, Dr. Maria Delgado. Um, she is a glaucoma specialist who is working out of Bogota, Colombia. She did her glaucoma fellowship at the Glaucoma Research and Education Group in San Francisco. Her research is focused on the early detection of glaucoma in patients of all ages, and she's an expert in all things surgical glaucoma from uh, filtration surgery through advanced laser techniques. And you can see a lot of her videos. And I know many of the audience members um, are already aware and know Maria very well. So I'm excited to have her uh, join us. And Nate Radcliffe, who um, seemingly has done his fellowship in Zoom because he's on almost every <laughs> Zoom talk that I've seen uh, since the pandemic started. Um, he is an associate clinical professor at Mount Sinai um, has had great pedigree with training at NYU and his fellowship with Bob Rich and Jeff Liebman at New York Eye and Ear. His research is also focused on surgical glaucoma and a lot of the diagnostic um, <clears throat> research that we've seen uh, recently that uh, is a little bit different than the mainstream OCT visual field has come from Nate's team, including corneal hysteresis. So a lot of exciting work. And um, the focus today though is gonna be on, on the surgical management of glaucoma with glaucoma drainage devices. Basic outline, we're gonna go over the basics of glaucoma drainage device surgery with Maria taking the lead on that. Uh, Nate's gonna cover a couple of advanced techniques that he does routinely in the operating room. If we have some time, we'll cover some of the complications that can happen. We may not get to that. And um, I'll show you um, some links to online videos that you can visit if we don't get time for that. And again, please keep the audience Q&A coming in so we can use those questions as we're going through. 
Um, there are different glaucoma drainage devices um, that are out there. This is certainly not a commercial discussion. So we're gonna focus basically on glaucoma drainage devices in general. Uh, a lot of the videos that you'll see will be the valve version, the Ahmed valve, uh, which is uh, more commonly used outside of um, the US in general. If you look at the numbers, it's about 50-50 in the US valve, non-valve. Outside of the US, it's, it's um, mostly valve devices that are being used. Um, so we'll cover both of these in our discussions and our question and answer. Um, I'll get to some videos if I can, uh, but hopefully a lot of the time will be taken up by uh, Maria and Nate. And uh, before I hand it over to Maria, I'm just going to reiterate here that uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this session. Um, send um, notes to CyberSight to Orbis, and you can also get in touch with me on both uh, Twitter and Instagram and let me know what you think and, and what we can do better. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here, Maria. And then I'm going to ask you if you can share your screen and get started. Nate, you can stay on mute, but I'll ask you questions back and forth. So if you have any thoughts um, as we go through, just please chime in and, um, and we'll go from there. Looking forward to it. All right, Maria, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kahook and Dr. Rathley. For me, it's a pleasure to be here to share and to learn. So I'm going to start um, to mention that, uh, like you say, drainage devices are pretty common, especially valve, uh, at least in Latin America, we have more experience with the valve than the non-valve because of the availability. And they have been used mainly in refractory glaucomas, but of course, in different cases, we can also use it as a first choice, like for example, neovascular inflammatory cases and many of the videos that we may see today. So. I just wanted to start by saying that always keep in mind that you're choosing a surgery for a patient. So try to choose the right surgery for that right patient. Not everything is for everybody. And you have to consider the baseline disease, uh, the eyelids, of course, the lens status, if it is phakic or pseudophakic or aphakic, the chamber and the angle depth. If you have vessels, if you have a clear or a cloudy cornea and the endothelium, uh, of course, you have to take... Um, to take in account the scaring of the conjunctiva if you have, have a patient with previous surgeries, what's the current medical therapy, if the patient is on maximal medical therapy, how's the adherence, and of course, uh, very important what the target IOP you want for your patient. So to start, uh, we're going from basic to complex, and I first wanna mention the anesthesia, which is of course very important. Um, at the beginning of our training, probably we start using more uh, of a block to have a, the patient to cooperate better. But now I'm preferring the local just infiltration in the subconjunctival space. Uh, I feel that the patient is very comfortable with this type of uh, anesthesia and actually the surgery flows uh, perfectly and um, is very simple and quick. Like you may see uh, in this video, you just uh, form that uh, bleb and then you're ready to start. Then one of the most important things is that you have to have a traction suture because you wanna go work in a space which probably in most of the cases is the super temporal space and the traction suture is going to help you to have all the exposure. And some people do it in the rectus muscle, for example, but I prefer the cornea because of course there's less bleeding but you have to be very careful and be very careful because um, if you go deep, you may perforate and there you're going to have to lead with a soft eye, which is very uncomfortable for the placing of the plate. And you have to do it uh, like in a long, do a long uh, run of the, of, the, of the needle to have, uh, to prevent it from, of course, uh, uh, falling off probably when you're uh, tractioning the eye uh, downward. Then the conjunctival incision, which is of course very important. That's you have to manage the conjunctiva very softly. Um, hey Maria, before you get to that part, maybe if yeah, you can sure. pause the video. Yeah, sorry, I'm, we're going to do this a lot to you, so sure, we're going to sure. we're right. going to have yeah. And Nate Nate has a tendency to interrupt like crazy, so just be <laughs> ready for that. Okay, um, the pre the previous video, um, it just makes me think of when you're first training, you know, a resident or a fellow and they pierce, they go through the entire cornea. There's sort of this freak out moment where it's like, oh my God, I just went into the interior chamber. What do I do? And my thing for that is just keep going. 
get get the bridal suture in and just create a paracentesis, put some viscoelastic in, and the patients tend to do very well. You don't have to think about suturing or or doing anything. Nate, do you have that experience as well, or do you put the bridal suture in the in the cornea, or do you do you do go old school and use the muscle? You know, I uh, somehow I'm able to keep eyes in primary position a lot these days. Uh, but I, I mean, th this technique is essential for any glaucoma surgeon to be able to control the eye position. Um, and I and I agree. You know, one of the great things, particularly about using an almond valve, is you can always fill the eye with viscoelastic and leave it there, never to be removed. And it takes away all the concern about leaking paracentesis, leaking wounds, leaking traction suture tracts, because um, there's just no tension on the uh, cornea at the end of the case. The chamber is going to stay deep. And over three days, while the eye is sort of filtering through that viscoelastic, you'll have a, a, usually a good chamber and not have to worry about leak. So it's, it's a gift. Yeah. Same with uh, if you ever have to suture an IOL with an Ahmed, you know, you just leave the viscoelastic in and that IOL is going to be much more stable than if you had to clean it all out. Yeah. And I, I know Maria is going to get to the paracentesis and viscoelastic a little bit later in her talk, but this is, this is great feedback. So Maria, sorry for interrupting, but we'll do it no, again. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. No, let's do it again. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the conjunctival incision, um, this one that you'll see in the video, I'm going uh, very limber. Um, I know that some people want to go a little, some millimeters behind the limbus, and it depends, of course, on the on the experience of the surgeon and 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 the prefer the, the, her, his preference. But uh, I like it like this because you have uh, a good coverage of uh, of the valve and of the tube uh, after you finish, and also you have to take into account if the patient has some adherences or previous surgery. Uh, that, of course, will make it difficult. And you have to be very gentle with the conjunctiva. You don't want to, to uh, be uh, uh, rough and then to have maybe a perforation or to have uh, not the amount of conjunctiva that you need for, for covering. So in this case, you see that we start with the Westcott scissors just for the first part, um, preserving, preserving uh, this conch. And then we move to go to do the the, sub the subtenous pocket, actually. And this is very important because there's where your, of course, your all your, your plate is going to be placed. So you need to have a good space. I do this, uh, like probably all of us with the Steven scissors. You have the Steven scissors that are uh, straight and some that are curved. I, of course, prefer the curved. I think that it goes smoothly and you go and dissect very easily the, the pocket and uh, to hold the plates sufficiently. Then the valve priming is absolutely mandatory. It, it seems obvious, but if you forget, then the next day you're gonna be with the patient with a high pressure and then you're gonna do something to, um, to have to, to open the, the valve system. And priming is very important also to not to do it. I don't know what you think. Um, um, probably we can open, uh, of course, a discussion in this. It's not to do it so yeah. forcefully because if you go so forcefully, you probably will damage uh, the, the valve system. What do you think about that? So this is, uh, so the previous video that you showed, I think is a really important one. I remember in fellowship, um, the, when I was learning different techniques on, on doing tubes, whether it was valved or non-valved, this step of taking a curved Steven scissors and going back and dissecting and really spreading my mentors, the people who trained me always used to say, this was the most important step in glaucoma drainage device implantation because it can be really frustrating if you don't go back and, and spread um, the scissors as much as you can. And, and that's what you're doing in the video. You're not being shy about you know, opening the scissors underneath Tenon's capsule, giving enough room to put that plate in. Oftentimes when you see trainees doing this for the first time, the plate goes in and it keeps spitting out and they can't figure out why and they're trying to put it back in and they don't have an assist when they're first doing this on their own. It can be really frustrating. So for anybody starting um, to do, I know we have a lot of residents and, and medical students who are, are listening in, this step of using curved Steven scissors, keep that in mind, uh, extremely important. And there are other parts of the surgery that get more attention, but that one is extremely important. This one, I think, and I'll, I'll ask Nate for his, his opinions on this. I think the priming part is a question that, that we get frequently. Um, I do some work with, with New World and every now and then, so this is the New World medical device, the Ahmed valve, 
um, calls will come in saying, hey, is it supposed to be a stream that's coming out? Is it supposed to be a trickle? There is no one-to-one -one relationship between the valve function and the stream that you're seeing coming out. It doesn't have to be a big stream. You don't have to be forceful. Um, it can be really a soft kind of um, you know, trickle that's coming out, similar to what you just showed in the video. Nate, what's your experience with that? I know you, I think you're the number one Ahmed user in the world these days. So, I mean, you do a ton of these. So um, what's your take on the priming part? Yeah, I, um, you know, actually one interesting thing is I, I'll have my technicians prime in, in some cases and, um, you know, they, they seem to get it done, uh, you know. <laughs> um, so so it, it, if you ever take the Ahmed valve apart, it's probably not quite what you think. It's basically two pieces of almost a material like not quite saran wrap, but a flexible little film. And um, they're just forming, um, you know, a, a little bit of pressure tension um, so that the fluid, you know, kind of um, only really pushes one way. So it, it's not uh, something that can be blown apart or, you know, it's really a flap, a plastic flap um, made out of a flexible material. So I don't as much worry about too much pressure harming it, which I have heard is a concern. Um, but I've, I've never seen one where I felt like an over prime did damage. That's right. um, and of course, viscoelastic is going to be coming through that thing after in most cases. And that doesn't seem to damage it or, or do anything either way. So I feel like it's a robust mechanism. And uh, as long as you get some aqueous going through, you're good to go. Yeah, this is great, Maria. You're showing a lot of uh, really good pearls here for, for people. So keep it going. Okay, so now the, the suturing of the plate, and I, I'm showing this um, before introducing the plate is just because I'm, I'm right now doing it outside of the eye. I just, uh, I don't use the two holes to put two separate stitches, but I just make one long throw. So with this, this is a seven old silk. Um, like you see, I just uh, prep it before putting it, the, the implant in. And then I, if you made the good pocket, like we were saying, then it will slide very easily in the, um, in the place that you want it to be. And then- um, That's perfect, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Looking, looking at what you just did, I think is kind of the example that we were talking about. There was no, I mean, this is an expert surgeon doing it, of course, but there's no kind of spitting out of, of the uh, plate. So perfect example of it. Um, then you have to fix the plate to the sclera, which is very important. Remember that you're mm, around eight to nine millimeters behind the limbus. So there the sclera is of course thinner and you don't want to go too deep. Of course here, as we were saying in the cornea, it's okay. Here is not okay. You don't want to perforate the sclera and go inside the eye. So you have to see the needle. Actually, I want to see the needle translucent through the through the scleral tissue that I am working in. His, there's a little bit of entanglement of the, of, the, of, the, of the suture, then we have it fine. And then uh, of course you will have, have your compass to measure that you're in the correct position uh, for tying uh, before, um, before tying, you, you, you wanna see that you're in the, in the right um, place and in the actual, the good length uh, that you wanna be. And I really like is, that. Mm -hmm. that that's, a, that's a really great idea. I actually hadn't seen that before. Usually, you know, the surgeon's trying to, to suture the, through the plate to the sclera. You add a lot of variables. It's tough to keep the eye in that position. And here you're making good control over the surgical field for ideal placement. And then you just simply slip the tube on later. It's great. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, then the tying, um, what I wanted to, to say about tying is that if you have, if you see your plate and you tie and you firmly tie it, you are avoiding sagging. Sometimes you tie, you make your knots and then the plate is not really in the good position and then it's loose. So then you have to, uh, a plate that may move forward or then you have to cut again and just tie it again. So you have to avoid sagging and tie firmly. This is a very thin sclera, multiple uh, retina surgery. So. Uh, be careful, but then you look and you see that actually your knot is behind the, um, the end of the plate, and then you're safe to, to continue to doing some knots and, and tie it firmly, and then cut. And of course, the tube will be, the, the knot, sorry, will be 
hidden be, be, uh, uh, behind the, the, the plate. So Maria, can you comment a little bit on the suture that you're using and um, yeah, different sutures? A, yeah. Right, this is a 7.0 silk. Um, I remember at the beginning uh, when I was in, in training, many of my attendings used uh, nylon. Um, but I, I, I actually moved to the silk. I think it, it, it goes firmly and I don't, I don't have any special reactions with it. And I, I think it's a, it's a good suture to have for, for many, many years. Okay. I know Nate doesn't really use suture. We'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but for me, I use Vicryl. I use 7.0 Vicryl. And I do that because it's the same suture that I use for the corneal bridal suture. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, just, it's uh, more efficient for us to just keep using, in, in some cases we can get away with just using one double arm 7.0 for the majority of the case. And then we use, you know, we can use that for closing conj as well, which we'll get to. Um, but I think that's one point for people who are starting to learn and, and um, doing this technique, get a little bit comfortable. The Vicryl is gonna stick around long enough for the capsule to form and hold the plate in place. So we're okay with that. Uh, but you know, a lot of this depends on who trained you. Um, I also, right. If you can comment a little bit on the, the slippage that you were talking about. Um, so are you talking about the plate moving forward towards the limbus after implantation? Towards the limbus, right. If, if, if you don't tie it firmly and probably uh, the, the, the suture is loose, then you will have a plate that is probably behind and you're not aware of it. And then when you close and you finish the surgery, probably you will, you're going to see that your tube is longer than you really expected it. And it's probably because just the, the valve moved a little bit because it was not firmly tied or firmly placed in the, in the spot that you wanted. Yeah, one thing that we, we talk about a lot is sort of how to put that suture into the sclera uh, in relationship to the limbus. So if you're putting it perpendicular to the limbus and you're a little bit more anterior with the placement, then that slippage is gonna be more frequent. If you can go tangential uh, or partially tangential, um, to the limbus, then it's going to be more of a, a side to side movement rather than a front to back. So I think keeping that in mind when, uh, when people are doing this procedure and you don't want this, how far back do you go for your plate um, implant? Where do you put it in relationship to the limbus? How far back do you go typically? Uh, I try nine millimeters in the super yeah. temporal. If I go nasally, I go probably eight. Yeah, Nate, what do you do from a placement standpoint? Um, you just try and go as far back as possible, I think, right? Yeah, so for me, the, the key is to get the plate behind the orbital rim. And uh, once it's behind, and you know, it's interesting here, you have an eye that's been pulled down with a traction suture. The forces acting on the plate will change a little bit once the eye's back in primary position because the orbital rim's position will change. That can be good and help keep a tube back, or it can put force to push it forward more. It just depends on how shallow that patient's orbit is. So um, I just, I keep that in mind, but for me, it's, it's probably 10 millimeters. The downside of my technique is sometimes I can't find the plate post-operatively because it's really a retro bulbar Ahmed valve. Yeah. If you can conceive of such a thing, it's not so much a tube, <laughs> you know, anchored to the sclera. Um, yeah. I think this is a, this is a really important point because you'll hear a lot of fear as to how far back you can go in the limbus. And if you're from the limbus and if you're super temporal, the package insert says eight to 10 millimeters. The reason for that is if you go further than 10 millimeters, in some cases, the plate can actually um, touch the optic nerve. And there's been some research on that from Ramesh Shayala and others um, showing that that can actually impinge on the nerve and um, cause some damage in itself. Um, but it also depends, as Maria said, on what quadrant you're going into. So if you're going infranasal, you don't have as much room. If you're going um, infratemporal, you might actually have a, a different set of parameters depending on the axial length of the eye. Um, so I think that's one thing that's worth looking at after this discussion. You know, For anybody who's interested, just look up the literature from Ramesh Ayala. We have a publication on that. And uh, Friedman from, uh, from Duke actually has an algorithm that she can go in and actually type in the axial length and the plate and, and she'll actually show you exactly how far from the limbus you can get. Uh, and she does a lot of pediatric surgery. So that was the reason for it with the shorter eyes. Really important point that maybe doesn't get as much airtime, but where you put it from the limbus is extremely important. All right, All right. Okay, thanks so after, Maria. No, thank yeah. you. And after, after you uh, type, then... Uh, You'll have to make the cut of the of the tube in a bevel fashion. Depending if you're going in the anterior chamber, you 
probably will go bevel up and bevel down uh, when you're going in the sulcus and measure accordingly to what length you want inside the anterior chamber of, or if you even, maybe sometimes you can cut it a little longer and maybe if you want, you can leave some, uh, some tube in the sclera if you, if you probably think you may need some tube for the future in, in certain cases. So this is, sorry, I didn't play the video. So this is uh, the way with the venous scissors and just um, to have uh, the bevel is, is nice because also it helps you to get into the uh, tunnel when you are uh, just introducing the tube into the AC. And um, here, and you were mentioning the paracentesis and the viscoelastic, I put there in the parentheses, not always, because I, I probably not always use it. Probably many, in many cases, yes, I do. The paracentesis will help you to have access in, in, in case you need it, and also to, to provide tone to the eye if you need it. And of course, the viscoelastic, like uh, Dr. Radcliffe is, was mentioning, is very important, and you can leave it and uh, not be afraid of, of, of leaving the eye at the end of the surgery with tone and of course not in, in, in hypotony, which would be not ideal. So this is just something maybe if you want to talk about it, just in some cases, what cases do you use it or you, do you use it always as a- yeah. as What a do you do, team? Nate? What, do you, what viscoelastic do you put in? Uh, I use ProVisc. Um, I think Helon is acceptable. And I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I even know some surgeons who use uh, this coat. So mm -hmm. I, I think you have some choices here. I would personally stay away from, um, you know, something like Helon 5 or, or even Helon GV, unless I knew I was headed for hypotony like the other eye had a bad problem. So uh, I use ProVisc. I leave as much as I like in the eye. So there's no, you do not need to hedge you can absolutely pack that eye filled with ProVisc. And uh, unless the iris gets clogged, you'll be fine. You know, the iris clogs the tube. The, the one thing that is true is that um, iris clogging a tube, if the tube, if the eye has ProVisc in, will result in uh, a very high pressure. So yeah. when you leave a lot of viscoelastic, you know, those careful post-op day one exams are critical. Yeah, so I, I, I'm very similar in practice. Um, I don't leave quite as much in. I was a little bit surprised when I was first starting out with tube surgery on the variability. I mean, some people are like Nate, just fill the whole anterior chamber. Um, others might be a little bit more worried about it. If you're using ProVisc, Viscoat, or even regular Helon, uh, that is a little bit more cohesive, you're going to be fine. Um, and we're talking about the, the valve devices, by the way, <laughs> yeah. uh, with the technique that we're, we're mentioning. Um, GV will result in significant spikes in many patients. So I would avoid using anything GV or above like Helon 5. Um, so yeah, look, practice patterns are a little bit different. And Maria, just so you know, from a connection standpoint, your videos are a little bit slow. They're not uh, fully playing uh, in line, but oh, let's, really? if that's an issue uh, coming up, then we'll just have Lawrence kind of step in with the deck that he has, but so far, so, so good. Yeah, here we okay. go. We have, yeah, this one we can see. Okay. So we continue with the scleral tunnel, which is, also very key point in the, in the surgery. Um, I, there you go, do you see that it's not at the limbus, it's behind the limbus, probably if you wanna go three to four millimeters behind the limbus, it's okay. Um, it depends of course also if you are using or not using a scleral patch and we will see that uh, in, a few, in a few minutes. Uh, but then you see the needle, you then, change the trajectory of the needle. So you, when you're perforating here, we're doing um, a very short tie. And as you see, I'm opening with the needle, I'm going behind, I'm going through the sulcus, but opening uh, a closed iridectomy from his previous surgery, because I want that ir iridectomy open, uh, not only for opening it, but also to see my tube, which I wanna, wanted to go through the tunnel and and um, insinuate, I'm gonna show you here before you go with your, with your video, because mm -hmm. I want to try to put the tube in and try to make it, um, let's say, uh, um, come out through that uh, opening just to see it. And then you see how it uh, magically perfectly goes like that. So I'm gonna stop sharing so that you can show your video, right? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll show mine Good. here as well. And let's I, I, liked, I liked what you were doing there. 
um, going back and forth because the, the reality of entering the, um, the eye with a needle is that it's not a guarantee that the tube is gonna follow the same pathway. And I can't tell you how many times my needle has gone in the anterior chamber and then my tube comes through the sulcus or vice versa. And keep in mind, we operate on a lot of eyes with PAS and there, there is no ideal place to enter the angle because there's no angle, it's all iris. And so uh, in some cases, in order to protect the cornea, you're gonna have to come in right where the iris is adherent and you're gonna have to go back and forth and create the pathway. And that's where injecting viscoelastic as you come in can push the iris back and then sawing back and forth basically saying, hey, <laughs> in a minute when the tube comes through here, I'm making a pathway can be just so, so helpful. And you know, the, the, you want to do that rather than put a tube too close to the cornea, because yeah. that's the, the critical thing. And so I, I liked what you did there. So you've mentioned a couple of things, Nate, that are, I think, important. So when we do this, we use a 23 gauge needle and we put it on viscoelastic. So when we're going in, we're prepared to deepen the chamber and use it as a manipulation device. The OVD is used to move things around if need be, because some of these eyes, like Nate said, don't have an angle um, and you can manipulate it with both the needle and the viscoelastic. There is a debate as to whether to use a 22 or a 23 gauge. Um, surgeons use both. There's question as to whether you're gonna get more peritubular leakage with a 22 gauge. Uh, but the surgeons who use a 22 get away with it just fine and they're very good surgeons. So I think you can probably use both. Um, how far you go away from the limbus for your entry is extremely important. Um, if you're closer than two millimeters, that's going to be a point where you're going to get erosions. And we've had a couple of questions about how we handle conjunctival erosions that we'll try and get to towards the end here. Uh, one of the things that I learned in traveling was the Z technique for entry that Felix Heal um, uh, taught most people in uh, Central South America. And of course, a lot of us here in the US learned from, from Felix um, to go way back and not necessarily have to use tutoplast or any type of patch graft. Um, but the, the point that I wanted to show here is a little bit different. So um, one of the main things that people have a problem with when they're first starting is getting the tube into the scleral tunnel. Uh, and there's a lot of fiddling around that happens. So the way that we do it, and I'll just play um, this video here so you can see, when we're coming out, we actually side swipe. Do you see that right there? So I'm going to play this um, over again, and I'll try and pause it. So as the needle is coming out, the needle tip, so now you're completely inside of the tunnel, you're no longer in the interior chamber, the tip of the needle swipes this way. And that gives you a little bit of a lip to get the tip of the bevel tube into the tunnel so that it goes in a little bit more, more easily. So I'll play that here so you can catch it. And then at this point, the tip is gonna start swiping here to the side. It's just teasing away a little bit of the sclera to create a little bit of a flap. See that there? So I think for trainees who are first starting, the tube goes right in every time when you do it that way. It's just a point that I think is um, very frustrating for trainees and that's one way to fix it. Won't be an issue if you can do it that way. So I'm gonna stop sharing, Marie. I'm gonna send it back to you here. Okay. So the other thing to mention is to always um, touch the tube with a non-tooth forceps. Try to be gentle with the tube. Don't want to, to rupture it, uh, which is also important to avoid damage. And um, well, let's. Then uh, one other thing that maybe is not um, routine or very common is to suture the tube to the sclera. I, many times I, I really want the tube um, fixed to the sclera and I do this with a nylon suture with then you bury the knot in the sclera. And especially if, wanna, if wa I, I wanna do something like you see in here, which is to make a little curve in the tube. And it is not, it is not occluding the tube, it's just m making a, a curve actually, just kinking it a little bit without occluding the lumen. And um, what do you think about this? Do you do this in some cases or do you fix the tube to the sclera? What do you uh, do, Nate? Yeah, I'll make a few comments. Um, first of all, it's, it's a very wise thing to make that type of track that you have there for so many reasons. Uh, number one, if this patient ever needs a reoperation, you've got extra tube length to play around with. If they have an erosion, 
you have, and you know, erosions happen in, you know, some, some number, 2% of tubes, something, you know, real. And um, you'll be able to reposition, come in through another quadrant and that extra length is good. Uh, you'll have a tube that's much more stable. And the way that you kind of gave it a, a sinusoidal pathway makes the tube itself less likely to migrate in the anterior chamber because the tube that's most likely to migrate is one that comes just straight in because it's very easy to go in that direction. Once you add a curve, it won't move as quickly. Um, and uh, so, you know, all those things are good. They take a little extra time. Uh, but they can, uh, you know, just sort of overall benefit the, uh, the tube placement. The other thing that you're really making sure here is the worst thing to do is to go through all the trouble of putting a tube in and find out that you don't have enough tube to get into the anterior chamber adequately. And uh, this adding this redundant part of the tube, make sure that that can never happen. And play the video for you. So scleral patch. Okay, Perfect. So the scleral patch, uh, we, we use the scleral patch. We don't have tutoplast or any other material when we need it, but the, the, the eye banks are, have uh, availability quite easily, I may say. So if we need it, we use it and it's no problem. And I really like to cover the tube in many, in many cases, especially cases where, where the, the patient has multiple surgeries, cases where probably the sclera was too thin, uh, probably myopic eyes with, by the way, have very thin scleras. And um, to cover it, you just, uh, I just throw uh, two uh, nylon sutures uh, hiding the knots uh, below the patch. And, um, and they, um, I, don't, I don't have any issues thinking that it may um, make the scarring um, process uh, worse. Uh, which some people say that they don't use it not only because of the extra time or the, or, or the little availability, but also because of the scarring process. What do you do, Nate, for your patch? Okay, this is, this is where I, I definitely love glue. You know, <laughs> your hands on it. Um, the, the first thing, you know, I, and you'll hear, but, you know, I went through an evolution in my technique where I used to, I used to sew the patch graph with two uh, nylons or maybe even four once upon a time. And, and um, it is interesting that uh, the patch graft doesn't have much reason to move once it's tucked under the conge there. So I'll, I'll typically not suture that. And um, you could suture your conge down, leave the patch graft kind of free and it, you know, it'll usually stay right there. Um, but I agree, I still use patch graft and you know, there are lots of surgeons who kind of have gotten off it. Uh, to me, it's just it provides an extra barrier of safety. Um, I will use uh, pericardium on an initial surgery and sclera if they erode. Mm -hmm. And that, that seems to work pretty well. Uh, I do agree the, the scleral patch graft is just bulletproof in terms of, um, you know, and it'd be interesting to, for us to compare erosion rates because it may be that I see more because I use pericardium. It, you know, I'll, 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 I could calculate it, but, you know, I may, I may have a, if I, if I do 300 tubes in a year, um, you know, I'll maybe do 10 erosion repairs. So maybe a 3% erosion rate. Um, hmm. like that. So I, I do something similar to Nate. So I glue uh, pericardium uh, and that's a step that for us saves a, a significant amount of time. And we close the conge with, with to seal glue as well. We'll hold off on that a little bit because Nate's gonna show a video of that I think in a little bit. So should I go ahead and play this video? Yep. Yeah, so the conjunctival closure, um, I'll do it with the vicryl with the same suture that you did the bridal suture in the cornea, um, which is uh, routinely probably a 7.0 or an 8.0. And uh, this case, for example, does, does not have a patch actually. So you just uh, make sure that you tie the, the edges. You don't have to make, a, I, I don't make a, like a continuous suture. I probably think that it, uh, well, when you cover the limbus and you front the edges, it, it goes pretty well. And uh, in most of the, in the cases, you don't have any issues with that. Do you close with the, with the with the Vicryl as well? So I close with Vicryl um, and I close it with either 7.0 or 8.0. 7.0 typically because we're using it for uh, the bridal suture as you, as you said. Um, we do only two interrupted sutures and we use glue for most of the closure. In some cases with very mobile conch, we'll just do the to seal glue. We won't use any sutures. And we started doing this. I remember the first case that we did with to seal glue was 2005. 
And we did a publication in uh, the British Journal of Ophthalmology on the use of, of glue. And we got a lot of hate mail after that. There's a lot of pushback. Um, and the paper um, uh, at the time I was working with, um, with Rob Noecker, and we were both um, sort of maligned for a couple of years in um, saying that this was possible. But now that's routine for Nate, and Nate took it like ten steps further. <laughs> so no, no one's ever given me a hard time about it, Malin. Yeah, thanks. I, I, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, you're just kind of sailing through life. Yep. Um, but I think when we get to Nate's video, I think this is going to be an important point. Right. Suture right. works very, very well, but to seal glue is not accessible everywhere. So Maria, what were you yeah. saying? Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, no, no. I was saying that we 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 don't have it very accessible. Primarily because of the cost, actually, if yeah. you're gonna just do one case, it's, it's, it's very over the top for the for the OR. So, yeah, that's. Yeah. But I would love to do it. That so, was a, so two hundred. So just say two hundred dollars per vial. You can use it for multiple cases if possible, and you save a significant amount of time by using it. So you save on <clears throat> on OR costs. But you're right. I mean, it's a it's definitely a barrier. Okay, so then we go to the. We're finishing, so you, you go to the to reforming the AC to make sure that you have a, your if you made the paracentesis, make sure you don't have a cytal. If you have, a, of course, vis, a viscoelastic in the eye, it's going to be okay. And check the tone, check the tone of the eye. Uh, you can go if you want to the next one, because uh, checking the tone is going to make sure that uh, you're not going to leave the eye hypo in hypotony. You don't want the eye in hypotony. You want the eye, it's, it's better to lead with a higher pressure in the post-op than to lead with a, with a very soft eye in the post-op because of the risks of, uh, of course, complications. So check the tone of the eye. I don't know why we do that. We, we, we check the tone of the eye with the, with the cannula, but it, it's, it's pretty easy to, to, to see how the cornea, um, what, what the tone in the cornea is. So oh, common, the tone of the eye. <laughs> yeah, common question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say something that's not very scientific at this point, but um, it's a common question that um, you know when you're with trainees and you feel the eye with your finger and you say that's about a twenty, yeah, and they're like, well, how do you do that? Um, the truth is, we don't do that, right? It's not it's not really that accurate. But if you are pushing on the side at the limbus with the BSS cannula, so the bottle cannula and the iris is um, moving significantly. If there's a lot of excursion of the iris when you're pushing on the limbus, the pressure is probably 15 or less. If you're pushing on the limbus and the iris isn't really moving at all with that movement, then you're probably over 22 to 25 or so. That's something that we played around with when I first started. So it's really just feeling and making sure um, that you're not you know, in the 50s, 60s. Uh, but when you have the viscoelastic in, it's kind of, um, it's kind of a moot point, really. Um, you have a, a, a valved implant in there. You're not as worried about the early post-operative fluctuations that might happen. And that's one big benefit of using the valve device over the non-valve device. You just have a lot more wiggle room. I don't know, Nate, do you do things differently? I'm sure you do, but you what know, do you do? It's, um, no, I, I agree with you. And I mean, there's some, some odd things that are happening with almond valves filled with fiscal elastic. Like for example, uh, oral diamox actually can keep the chamber formed a little longer <laughs> because it, it reduces the aqueous rate and keeps the viscoelastic in the anterior chamber for maybe another day or two. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. It, it's, but because, you know, it's the aqueous that's eventually going to push the viscoelastic out of the anterior chamber. Um, but, but I do play a game with the residents where I try to, I tell them, try to guess within 10 millimeters of mercury what the pressure is <laughs> going to be tomorrow. And, you know, you'd be surprised how often we're wrong. And that's, that's just a high amount of variability. And that includes valved and non-valve tube shunts. It's just variability abound. Yeah, yeah. yeah Unfortunately, I was, that's I was part of glaucoma say, surgery. Sorry, go ahead, Maria. Yeah, I was going to say that, that, yeah, you feel you feel quite safe when you're using the AMET. But I've seen hypotony. I've seen cases where things don't go like you expected. And, and then you have to, to do to manage how to get out of that. Yeah. Absolutely. So Nate, I unshared here. Uh, if you can go ahead and share your part. So Maria, thank you. Now you get to no, grill Nate on sure. a few things and feel free, by the way, to make fun of Nate's technique because uh, apparently nobody's ever given him a hard time about how he does things. So that's what we're here for today. So Nate, go ahead. Let me know if you have any problems sharing. Yep. No problem. Um, so, you know, I, uh, 
I, I had a surgery a few years back where uh, the patient was just not tolerating anything. And the anesthesiologist looked over and said, this surgery has to be over now. And I had put the tube in, I had put the, the tip of the tube in the anterior chamber, but there was basically nothing else. I hadn't put the patch graft down. I hadn't sewn anything. And uh, I took one stitch of Vicryl and kind of reapproximated the conge. And that was the end of the surgery. It was an emergency. Um, and the patient did shockingly well. I, I think my first observation was that I used less steroid postoperatively because I think part of my prednisolone use over the years was just fighting my own Vicryl. And which, which does have inflammation. So it, it eventually, I, I went back and revisited step-by-step step over probably five or six years and maybe a thousand cases to try to cut out as many steps in the almond valve as possible while maintaining a safe surgery that's efficient in the OR and heals well. Uh, we've, we've published our results, but, but here's the technique that we've arrived at. So I begin with a conjunctival pyridomy about six millimeters behind the limbus and I'm starting the video. Um, there is an area where the conge and tenons thicken and start to get into orbital tissue. And um, you uh, kind of dissect down to the sclera. You see that little barrier there. And I um, get into this supratemporal space. This can work in any quadrant. Um, and again, Malik, you described the importance of getting in the right plane, of spreading with those uh, scissors and uh, collecting the tenons as you go. And you don't want to over dissect that pocket because that pocket's going to hold your almond valve in place. So you want it to be a bit of a tight fit. Here I'm making a dissection where my patch graft will go. And um, you see there's not going to be any tension on this wound because it's relaxed and it's back. So when we go to close it with glue, we're not counting on the glue to kind of hold things together. We're just counting on the glue to keep a reapproximation. Nate, I have a question for you. So you yes. just, um, so you said you want to have the pocket hold the Ahmed plate. Yep. Are you controlling that by how far you're separating the yep. scissors? Yep. Okay. And, and you'll, you'll notice it's a tight squeeze, even with me getting this tube in through my conge uh, dissection. Okay. So, you know, I, I don't want th this concept of over dissection, which was never a concept when you're sewing, you want over dissection if you're sewing, right. but if you're, the, the concept of this surgery is we're using the tissue to maintain some stability and some structure and making smaller pockets that almost squeeze your implant are sort of going to help you here. And ideally there's sort of a bottleneck right after this goes in that won't let the tube slip forward because got I haven't it. dissected enough conch to allow that to happen. Okay, got it. Yeah, that's a subtlety that I actually never got with your with your procedure. Yeah, so yeah, I'm glad you, you said I'm it. Fighting this a little bit, I have to wiggle, you know, yeah. but you know, and and then I I the answer here, how far back I go is just I call it deep sixing the the tube, but you know it's gone. And now I'm going to tug to make sure it can't come forward. So that's the orbital rim locking that tube into place. Now I'm going to cut, and um, you know the the um, I'm going to plan for a little turn. That turn that I just showed you there is what's going to help prevent the tube from sliding in and out because that little turn is actually enough to cut some of those forces down. Um, and so you'll see here. Let me I'm, ask Maria just really quick. So Maria, are you getting the steps, or is it choppy for you the video? No, it's fine. Thank okay. You. All right. So it, apparently it's just my computer. It's uh, it's the internet in Denver. Keep going. <laughs> the reason the internet in Denver is slow is because everyone's busy tweeting about getting their vaccines now. That's right. That's right. Okay. We do have the vaccines in house. Yep. Keep going though. <laughs> well, what did I do? I'll go back to that. Okay. So we are right here and um, okay. So the tube tube comes in and I'm um, angling a little bit here. Uh, always go bevel up. You know, if I go, if I'm going into the sulcus as a plan, uh, I, I might reverse it. Um, and that depends on whether I think there's vitreous in the sulcus or not. If I think there's vitreous in the sulcus, I keep a bevel up. If I know that I did the cataract and there's no vitreous, I'll go bevel facing down to avoid the iris. Um, I have viscoelastic in this needle, 
I'm coming in. You'll notice I don't make a paracentesis routinely for my tubes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm coming at an angle here. And uh, you'll notice it's I'm, I can't cross the pupil with this track. And again, that's if my tube does slide further in. Um, it shouldn't. And there I'm making your cut, Malik, that you described. Yep. Yep. I agree. Very, very useful. Now I'm getting lucky on this surgery. There's no bleeding. You know, yeah. so no, no question why this one made the uh, YouTube uh, <laughs> series. Um, and so uh, I usually use curved forceps. Um, sometimes I'll use the Fechner forceps to push the tube in. I'd say this is about a three and a half millimeter tunnel, but uh, it, it will provide, you'll notice it's kind of hard for me to get it in and watch what I do here. I'm going to wiggle the eye by the tube. And that tells me, Nate, this tube ain't moving. You don't need to sew it with uh, nylon. If that tube slid around, I would sew it, you know, Got with it. nylon or Vicol. I agree, Malik. I use sort of whatever gets me through the surgery with the fewest packages of suture opened. Yeah. Um, now, believe it or not, the surgery is almost done. Uh, here's my pericardial patch graft. That's going to sort of provide a little blanket of safety. And um, now, now notice this conge comes together so well. I have just cauterized the conge closed at this point, but we're going to put a few drops of the seal glue. It has a thick and a thin. I think you're supposed to go thick first. Uh, I don't think it matters too much what you use, except the thin kind of flows away fast so that, you know, it, it maybe gives you a little more time to act if you use the thick first. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's going to stick together pretty well, but if you can actually get the conge to meet with the conge on the other side, it'll heal even better because uh, the tenons is, tends to be sort of the stubborn part. But here we have, uh, you know, our closure. And um, now I'm going to give a steroid antibiotic. And it's amazing, just 30 seconds or so after we closed, the fluid um, from this uh, steroid um, I don't show it in this video, but you know, sometimes I'll have it come over and elevate my recently glued area of conge and it usually stays together through that challenge. So how long do you actually um, squeeze the conge together to keep it in place post gluing? Do you hold it there for a count of five, 10? What do you do? Yeah, you know, I'd say maybe 10 seconds, something like that. So yep. when we were doing these cases, um, you know, for the first time trying to use this, um, that was a big debate that we had. Um, should it be a 30 second count? Should it be a yeah. 20 second count? But I think five, 10 seconds is more than enough. Um, the, the and you, you showed that up, there. Yeah. The thing that'll mess it up is active bleeding. Yep. And um, if you have a tremendous amount of bleeding, there's just too much fluid there. And the other thing is you should dry that tissue before you apply your glue. Um, ideally it is very dry. That's when glue works the best. The times where I've had my glue fall apart were usually in hot eyes, neovasculars, where they were bleeding a lot, people on blood thinners, um, or if for some reason I was unable to get a dry field. Why don't we um, show your video for clear path? And then after that, we'll go to the question and answer. But yeah, go ahead, Maria, before we yeah, move on. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, when you mentioned that you go, um, that your conjunctival incision is uh, six millimeter behind, is because you need that conch to, of course, glue. I mean, you, you would not yep. be able to do this at the limbus, right? I think that's right. I mean, actually in one of the videos you showed where you put your scleral patch graft down, mm -hmm. I, I started, my mouth started watering because I wanted to put the <laughs> glue and it would have worked in that case. So you had nice lax conch, but if you're in a situation where um, the conch is tight and there's tension, glue can't really overcome tissue tension. It's just there to sort of keep things. And one of the things I, I have to say that you probably don't is I tell the patient, you know, you could undo my surgery by rubbing your eyes. And, um, you know. So, yeah, yeah. we, um, just to be contrarian here. So yeah. we actually, of course, my son's coming down here during the session. So he's probably gonna come and say hi to you here. Zay, do you wanna say hi to Uncle Nate or no? He says no. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually go at the limbus maria and we do use glue and we close just fine we're basically instead of pinching the two um sides together we're actually going kind of like where you put your suture that yes. you did yep. and it and it works okay but we we do secure the plate to the sclera with suture which nate doesn't do so it just depends on sort of how you're mixing and matching things right um 
Yeah, I agree, Malik. You can no, you can close a limbal wound. Uh, you can close a Zen, for example, with glue. If you know, but it's nice to have something to pinch together. Yeah. So Malik's right. Like going laterally and pinching is going to work really nicely. Um, yeah, in that in that setting. Um, why don't you show this video and then we'll go to the, we have a bunch of questions here. So after this video, maybe we'll just go to uh, sort of a lightning round of questions yeah. and answers. And the final thing I wanted to say is I think you can sometimes get away with less, um, less uh, prednisolone alone if you glue and uh, patients may be less prone to rub because, you know, the sutures do cause that foreign body sensation and the glue typically is comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's the clear path. You're going to see a lot of the same uh, concepts. And, and one of the important things, this eye's had some prior surgery, so I can see that that looks like there's been a vitrectomy. I see some scarring. Um, and I'm, of course... Uh, he does want to say hi, Nate. Sorry. But hey, how's it going, Zaid? Yeah. <laughs> Uncle Nate. <laughs> so this is all sort of very similar. Uh, I've got my clear path here. Um, I, as I say, I think the toughest part is always tying this to be watertight. Uh, for some reason, it just gets me every time. Maybe I don't suture enough in my daily life, uh, <laughs> you know, but, uh, and then, you know, you test it here, which I don't think I show, but after you go ahead and occlude, you'll take the 30 gauge needle and you'll uh, make sure you can't push any aqueous through at all. Even a slight drip is a problem. So I'm pushing it in now and there's a variety of ways to kind of taco the tube in, but it's fine to fold in half. Uh, it's, you know, it's going to be a tighter fit than the almond valve, but we now have it back in that space. Oh, and I'm sewing. <laughs> and, uh, it looks like, looks like I am about eight millimeters back. So I probably failed my test of coming forward too easily. Um, so I put one stitch in, uh, and again, I think, you know, you, you just, everything is whatever the eye needs, whatever it's telling you it needs, you know, you can do, right. Um, and here again, I'm, you'll notice I'm coming across the ACO, but this time in the sulcus. And I want to stop right here. This, this, um, this is the critical view. Uh, I have a needle that came in through the sulcus. And when you come in through the sulcus, you want to push your needle across the anterior chamber and put the needle anterior to the iris on the other side. And, and that's a great way to tell that you're anterior to your IOL. If you can't put your needle uh, in front of the iris, it may be because your IOL is there and you, you don't want to come into the vitreous. I've had it happen once or twice in my career. I, and sometimes, by the way, you do make your needle in the sulcus and your tube ends up in the vitreous anyway, because, you know, remember, things can kind of change their course. They don't have to follow the same track in. Um, but this is just one little tip. Now, I can't put viscoelastic in this chamber if I'm doing a clear path because uh, it's occluded and I'm gonna have a high pressure. Yeah. That to me makes things a little tougher. Um, but here I am, I'm in the sulcus, I'm coming out. By the way, I do feel that the clear paths do very well in the sulcus and that's because there's no flow initially and so you don't have to worry as much about iris clogging um, and everything's a little bit more stable at week seven when that vicral dissolves and the pressure comes down um, because uh, so you don't get clogging of the iris in the tube, you know, quite as often. Uh, here's my patch graft. This looks like the uh, the New World product, which we have a nice uh, scleral patch graft that uh, New World Medical makes, crimping it so it stays folded. So that's a double patch graft. And again, the closure is going to be very similar. Um, and I'm, I'm using Vicryl, I guess, in this case because I have it. Maybe that conj looked like it was bleeding a little more than I wanted, and this is just a running. Um, closure uh, taught to me by Celsotello, or actually, it looks like I'm just doing two interrupted. Yeah. So one of the things, so Maria, you, I don't think you have access to the Claire Path device at this not, point, right? Not yet, not yet. So I remember sitting in an advisory board that was unrelated to glaucoma drainage devices with Nate sitting on the other side of the room. And he had one of the models of the ClearPath when it was first released and he was rolling it sort of like you roll an IOL. <laughs> and he was showing me how flexible it was. And um, I had a chance to work with New World on this device when they were going through the development process. And that was certainly something that we wanted to do which is make it um, more flexible so that it's easier to get into places 
But one thing that we're seeing with this device, and I think Nate, you're doing this too, is a smaller conjunctival incision, rolling it and then putting it through that conjunctival incision. And it kind of opens up so you can make a smaller conjunctival incision. It's much more flexible than the bar belt. It's almost like an IOL. Yeah, yeah. But from a performance standpoint, I would say, you know, clear path uh, from a post-operative standpoint and bar belt are about the same, at least in my hands, they're about the same. Uh, there are some advantages intraoperatively from an ease of use standpoint that I think are real, but hopefully they'll start. I know a lot of people that are listening in don't have access to the clear path at this point, um, but I think that'll start to change as they start spreading it around commercially. So let's take a little bit, Nate, thanks for going through that. Um, and uh, let's start going through some of the questions and answers here for the next like 20 minutes or so, if you guys are okay with that. Uh, and I'll start off here with uh, this first question. Let's see, if a patient has been implanted with an AGV and has PAS with shallow AC and the tip of the valve is in the AC, um, is small and touched iris, what to do? So if you're touching iris with the tube, basically, what do you do? If you're touching the iris, I don't worry that much. If I'm touching the cornea, I do worry. So if, 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 if it is a shallow chamber and probably you feel, you, you see that the, the tube moves, I will move it. I will move it and put it in the sulcus. But, but touching the iris in general is not actually generally a problem. Uh, the problem is the endothelium of the cornea. Yeah, you agree, Nate? I, I agree, and I will also say I'm shocked at how well the uh, iris tolerates that tube. Touching it, pushing it aside, uh, I don't think I ever use steroids on a chronic basis in omid valve patients because the tube is causing iritis by touching the iris. I think it's a never. I mean, it sounds crazy to me, yeah. but it just doesn't cause the problem that you would think it would. So I, I like to leave the tube um, much longer, I think, than most surgeons do in the anterior chamber, and I go tangential. So the tubes that I put in um, have significant contact sometimes with the iris for the course of that length inside of the anterior chamber. And I agree with Nate, it doesn't cause any issues. Where it does cause occasional issues is if the tube is implanted in the sulcus and there's extreme sort of touching of the periphery of the iris, you can get like a UGH um, type syndrome with that, but anteriorly haven't seen that. Um, so next question, should we mark, this is a good question that I haven't actually um, seen on a session like this. Should we mark the conjunctiva with a marking pen before cutting? Do you ever do that, Maria? Is there any reason to do that or no? Actually, I never do it, no. Yeah, Nate, you just innately know what to do, right? So you don't have to mark it. I, I eyeball it, Malik. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, so yeah, I don't either. Um, I think when you're first starting out, it's okay to do that. So if you're teaching somebody, a resident or a fellow, and they're not sure exactly how long to make that pertomy, um, err on the side of marking the conjunctiva if you're not sure. Yeah. Uh, but in practice, you, you tend not, it's not really as precise. You can go, you know, millimeter over and it's not a big deal. Um, all right. I noticed with pediatric, this is the next question. I noticed with pediatric patients, when I use Ahmed valve, there is exuberant encapsulation after a few months to the point that the bleb is palpable and visible at the supertemporal eyelid. Do you have any tips to avoid this? Or if it happens, what do you do? So encapsulated tube, let's say it's an FPA pediatric model uh, for the AGV. Nate, let's start with you. What do you do? Do you do anything to avoid it? And if you do get it, what do you do? And maybe cross over between peds and adults because it, it, it can yep. cross over. So, so um, you know, it is, it is felt that it's the aqueous itself that's causing that sort of capsule formation. Um, aqueous suppressants uh, have been shown, if initiated early after the omid valve, to help uh, keep the pressure low and ultimately lead to better outcomes. So encapsulation to me is a, definitely an indication to start an aqueous suppressant and to taper, taper the steroid as quickly as the eye will tolerate. So if I see that at week one, I see a big bleb over my Ahmed, they're back on fixed combination dorsolamide timolol, timolol bromonidine combos, some aqueous suppressant, cut the PRED very quickly. And um, there is, then there is a sort of even crazier maneuver which is if their pressure is very, very high, uh, you can do what's called a serial tap of the bleb, where you put a 30 gauge needle into the bleb once a week for say five or six weeks to try to decrease the tension on the bleb, which should inhibit the remodeling that's causing that big problem. I'll tell you, this doesn't seem to fix it all the time, uh, but it's something you can try. Okay, Maria, anything to add yeah. to that? 
Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Uh, probably uh, when you see Professor Penko uh, talking about trabeculectomy and all these, uh, you don't want these um, inflammatory AQs, but also all the all that pressure going into this encapsulation going in. You 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 want to keep the valve functioning, um, and the aqueous suppressants are key, and we use it very early in the post-op most of the time. Okay, that's great. So there was a paper um, out of UCLA by Simon Law that came out a few years ago that talked about starting aqueous suppressants early uh, with the Ahmed valve. I think that is a, an under-referenced paper that everybody should read in training. Um, and that's one of the things that has increased the success of the Ahmed valve in, in our hands with less encapsulation. So if the pressure is over 10 postoperatively, get the patient back on their drops, keep their pressure very, very low for as long as you can afterwards, and you're less likely to get the encapsulation. So that might be another thing to just kind of watch and see for the question that came through for the pediatric patients. If you're getting these longer sort of high teens, low 20 pressure, and you don't have them on their drops, get them back on their drops, get their pressure down, less chance of encapsulation. Yeah, what we were talking before is uh, the hypertensive phase and the hy yep. you don't have to wait for a hypertensive phase. You, you kind of uh, go before just to avoid it. Actually, I don't want to go into a hypertensive phase. Yeah, one of my uh, one of my fellowship um, attendings used to say that hypertensive phase is the discussion you have before the discussion about failure. <laughs> so, That's so right. try uh, Absolutely. to avoid it. Yeah, uh, my line there, Malik, is it's not really a hypertensive phase. Sometimes it's a hypertensive stage. Stage. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It is true. So we got a shout out from Rwanda here, which is really nice to see. Thank you for, for saying hello. Uh, next question. Do you have any other tips for the scleral sutures besides seeing the needle through the sclera? So what I think this is asking is if you're making your scleral pass with your suture, whatever suture you intend to use, how do you make sure you're not going too deep? Um, and you can also say, how, how do you make sure you're going deep enough? Is there anything, Maria, that you do to make sure that pass, which can be difficult with bleeding, no assistant, right. conj getting in the way. So what do you do? Yeah, first get the good zoom. Zooming is great in this in this part of the of the surgery. You need to see well. You have your assistant with one hand probably uh, moving the eye if you need it, with the other hand with the with the wax cell uh, to making clear that you have clear access. And you can do it slowly. You don't have to go. Yeah. Uh, all the way past, but it's, it's difficult to know how deep you are but this translucent I, I don't know I, I just mentioned that if you see the needle you're sure but also you don't want to go episcleral because then you have the, the the suture in the episclera and then of course it's not gonna actually fix the plate so so it's it's of course practice but but make sure you're in the sclera in a in in a, in not 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 in the in the whole thickness of the sclera and depending on if your patient has a scarring, as I was mentioning, and as, as far back you go, keep in mind that the sclera is thinner. So, right. so make sure that, that you use the right, the right depth. Yeah, the anything, zooming, yeah. I, I think the zooming and, and having a clear view is, is, is the most, the best tip actually. Yeah, I agree with all that. Nate, is there anything you wanna to add to that? No, no. Okay, I agree. okay so a question here um, that uh, I'm interested to see what you think about this. So Nate, we'll start with you. What about vortex vein impingement by the plate? Is that something you consider when you're doing surgery? No, I don't, you know, it's, and, and I'll tell you, there's just a lot of things that, you know, I somehow get away without uh, knowing too much about, um, you know, and, and this, I, I put plates in all four quadrants and I don't really vary the technique any different from what you've seen. Um, I agree. You can't go as far back in certain quadrants, but I'm not doing anything special to avoid the, you know, the fourth, uh, you know, the trochlear muscle, for example, you know, um, the, the superior oblique, um, you know, I'm just putting tubes in and, um, you know, covering them up. So uh, I don't worry about any, any of that. Maria, do you worry about question. it? Yeah, go no, ahead. Actually, no, actually, no. Oh. To answer the question first. No, actually, no. Okay. No, go ahead and ask your probably, question. Probably never, never thought about it. Actually, you know, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, my question was, uh, since we don't have barbells or now the clear path, we are uh, always with the amets, and because of the because of these uh, encapsulations and cysts, sometimes we prefer, of course, the super temporal quadrant. And if that one is not good, or if we have to move the valve, usually we go to the supranasally. 
But yeah. we don't use most of the time the inferior quadrants. What do you think about that? Or, or how often do you use AMETs in the inferior quadrants? Yeah, what do you do, Nate? Sure, um, I, I do typically go uh, supranasal. So, so I go super, super temporal first, supranasal. Then I go inferonasal. And the last is inferotemporal because it's the most exposed area and you're most likely to get an erosion. Um, so, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I agree with you in that approach and, and typically I'll do, I used to do a supratemporal um, Ahmed and then a supranasal Bearvel 350. And so you can, you know, you can go either, either style in, in that order. Yeah. So I go super temporal as first choice. If I have to do something else, I try to go infranasal with a clear path. Uh, rather than putting a bar velt in that area, just because, it, or rather than putting an Ahmed in that area, the Ahmed um, being a little bit higher is more difficult to do infranasally. Um, and the really good thing about using either the bar velt or the clear path in that situation is you can more easily trim it if need be. So you don't have to go with a full 250 for either device. You can trim a little bit off just to get it in. Or this is something that's underutilized and might be controversial. You can do an FPA and do a pediatric uh, plate in that area where if you want something that's valved, FP7 is a little bit more difficult to do in phrenasally. You can put an FP8 in there and actually um, get significant IOP lowering. So the plate size thing, you know, more better. That's also controversial. I think if you're getting around 184 to 250 for the plate sizes, then you're probably okay. Um, so next question here. Uh, we touched on this a little bit. Where can I place the glaucoma drainage device from the limbus to avoid optic nerve touch? And I'll, I'll just start off by saying that the following the label is really important. So eight to 10 millimeters for the Ahmed, six to eight millimeters uh, for the clear path. Uh, Barvelt is more similar to AGV. So eight to 10 uh, millimeters would be fine. Uh, Nate, do you do calculations before going in or I know you just kind of throw it back and hoping for orbital fat basically is what yeah, you're saying. And, so, and, I, and I want to make a comment about diplopia. Um, I really don't see much, and, and I'll say by much, I mean less than one in a thousand Ahmed valves will get diplopia for me. And, um, you know, I, I have to believe it's because I'm not sewing because I think, in, you know, and if you think about rubbing up against the optic nerve, I don't anchor the plate down. So if the optic nerve wants to push it back forward, I think it can do that. What worries me is, you know, if you sew something against another thing, like a muscle, yeah. then I could see the double vision coming in. Um, and so, you know, the, the, there's, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's um, I think it's, it's fair to kind of consider, uh, that, you know, that it might be okay not to sew some of these things into place. But most importantly, don't ever put or suture a tube into a place it doesn't want to be. Listen, yeah. to, listen to what the eye's telling you. And if it's not liking where something is, you know, there, there's probably a reason for it. Yeah, I can say that for any procedure that you're doing in ophthalmology, uh, yeah. not, not just tube surgery. So listen to what the eye is trying to tell you. Yeah. Uh, really quick, there are a couple of things that I'm, I'm just going to answer really quick to get to some of the others. Can the scleral patch graft be tied with Vicryl? Absolutely. You can suture it down with Vicryl, no problem. Um, and, and it's a great, Mal I just have to say, it's a great yeah, idea yeah. to do that if you can, because uh, I've seen erosions that were brought about by nylon. Uh, nylon can be a source of erosion, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We do Vicryl when we, when, you know, if we need something extra to the to seal, we do Vicryl all the time for that. Do either of you double um, the, um, do you fold your pericardium ever to cover or do you just do a single layer? Maria, what do you do? Actually, we have just a sclera, so it's too thick. So yeah. we just use yeah. the, the, the sclera. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're getting more congratulations from Japan in this case. Um, can it be done without scleral patch graft under cover of partial thickness scleral flap? Do you ever do that, Maria, where you create a flap? I actually don't, but I do have colleagues here that do the flap like a regular trabeculectomy and they introduce the tube through that. So yeah, it's a, it's an alternative. Okay. Yeah. There are many, many ways to cover tubes. Mm -hmm. And if you just Google it, you'll see there's technique of actually creating a, a full flap that's vertical, uh, that's actually perpendicular to the limbus rather than a tangential. Uh, so many ways to do it. I think Felix Heel Z sort of formation going in way back, four millimeters back is um, most of the time all you really need. Um, how many hours after 
um, should the eye patch be open after the surgery? So how long do you tell them to keep? This is a really good basic question. So after surgery, how long do you tell them to keep the patch on? Nate, maybe we can go with you first. Yeah, just a day. Um, but it, you know, I do a lot of surgery on monocular people. And uh, if you can, uh, you use just lidocaine instead of lidocaine bupivacaine. So they get their vision back if you're blocking and then they can go home with a clear shield. Yeah, same thing for you, Maria. Yeah, same thing. I, I patch the eye uh, after surgery and I am the one who take out the patch uh, the next day when I see them at the uh, in my office. So somebody wants to know, Nate, how long your follow-up, so this is a doubter, how long is your follow-up for your sutureless Ahmed's? Yeah. How many, how many decades? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's um, you know, look, some of them are out, some of them are out 10 years. Uh, we, we published on, I think, one to two year outcomes. Um, what, what I will say, um, you know, in terms of all the ups and downs of that technique is I think you get faster healing. You, uh, you don't get uh, much in the way of tube erosion. The biggest thing you get is um, you'll sometimes get a tube tip that comes too far into the eye. If you catch that early, by the way, you can push on the plate, you know, day one or week one and move the tube back. Um, Cause again, nothing's sutured in. Um, and, you know, rarely you'll get a tube that slips out of the eye. Although I have to say, I've seen all those things with sutured tubes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I think again, if, if you really pay attention to the video that I showed, which is on YouTube, Radcliffe Ahmed, um, it's all about wound construction and planning, and it's a very reliable, safe, and efficient technique if it's done uh, with attention to those things. Yeah, I think both of you have social media presence. So um, for the audience, if you want to learn more about everything else that's going on, that's a really nice tool that we've been using more and more um, during the pandemic, just putting things on to help each other with education. Do either of you, Maria, do you use mitomycin for your tubes ever? Uh, ever, yes, not often, but, but yes, I do. Um, uh, for example, in cases that have uh, a lot of scarring or uh, neovascular cases, I use mitomycin in the sponge. I, I open the, not, not injected, I open the, the conch in the regular manner. And then in the sponge, I put the mitomycin C, probably 0.4 milligrams per, per ml uh, for four minutes. And, uh, and I wash it and I, I, I do it. And I, and I feel that it, that, of course, I don't have a study. Uh, I will no. have to do that. Uh, but, but I feel that in some cases, uh, it will help. It will help uh, the fibrosis. All right. Nate, do you use either mitomycin or... Actually in the... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. No, I was saying that some people also use them. And I don't, I, I, I haven't used them, but in the, in the post-op, probably needling, like you were mentioning, uh, uh, and injecting uh, mitomycin C. Yeah. Yeah, there's, so there's a study out of UCSF looking at that and we're getting more and more data. Some people have great success with using mitomycin. I, I don't, but I've used anti-VEGF agents in the past. There's a question on that. Um, Nate, do you use mitomycin with your Ahmed's ever? I don't. Um, and, and the only type of revision I typically will do is I'll go to the operating room. I will cut off the um, capsule and then uh, bring the conch back over. And I don't do it often. I'm more likely to put in another tube. Um, and, and that I, I believe has a 50% success rate. And I'm thinking of a paper by Scott Smith from a while ago. Um, so it's not nothing, but you know, it's, yeah. it, I tend to revise Ahmed's more when it's a patient where I don't think I have the real estate really to go with another tube. And, and after a failed Ahmed, I typically will go with a non-valved um, tube shunt one final thing I just have to say is if you really want to get into it, you could convert an Ahmed valve into a non-valved. Um, yeah. You know, you, you, would, you basically are just going to take apart that plastic thing. <laughs> and then you're, you know, you're going to remove those two little strips of saran wrappy material. And then you're going to have to tie it off with a Vicryl so that you don't get hypotony. It's possible, you know, if, if you want a non-valved. And again, the, the, the reason to do that is you probably would get a slightly lower long-term pressure but it'll take seven weeks to open instead of the immediate pressure relief you get with an Ahmed. Right. Um, that would be off label just to yeah, be sure. Label. <laughs> so there is, gonna, oh, go ahead, Maria. Yep. That, that I have also unroofed some of these Ahmed valves, uh, removing the, the, the capsule yeah. and uh, it tends to form again most yeah. of the time. Uh, so 
So it's not really very good. Yeah, I've had, I've had, so there are a couple of questions here on anti-VEGF agents and also on 5-FU. Um, we've used a ton of anti-VEGF agents for almost everything possible in, in glaucoma. Where anti-VEGF agents make a lot of sense is if you're doing NVG a case, that's of course a no-brainer. Um, you can inject them in the clinic before you go to the operating room and have a much smoother course of the surgery. We've seen anti-VEGF agents work better with trabeculectomy or express um, rather than glaucoma drainage devices. Mitomycin 5-FU anti-VEGF agents in my hands tend not to work as well when you have a plate in place. And like Maria said, once you have the encapsulation going in and removing it, I haven't had much luck with that either. It tends to, to reform, but very good surgeons who I trust do have success with it. So I think to, to each their own. Um, let's see, there's a question here about, Nate, just really quick, do you, um, how do you treat the viscoelastic in the anterior chamber with clear path? Do you empty all of that out at the end of the case? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 ideally you never put it in. Um, and then you don't need to clear anything out. However, uh, if you have bleeding, still the best way I know to stop bleeding in the eye is to fill the chamber quickly with viscoelastic and then take it out five minutes later. So, but, you know, just keep in mind that, um, you know, you, you really don't want to leave any viscoelastic because you're not going to have any short-term pressure re reduction unless you're doing something like needling a failed trabeculectomy and putting in a clear path in one surgery, which is uh, not, not entirely uncommon for, for some of us. Yeah, there's a question here, and we'll start off with Maria. Uh, what's your philosophy on going in to do a tube in a patient who might have a shallow chamber and also has a cataract? Um, in this scenario that, that the questioner is asking, it's an NVG patient, but um, do you combine FACO with your GDD frequently? Would you leave, um, or it, what's your decision-making in that, in that scenario? Yeah, well, I, I tend to worry first about the pressure rather than the cataract. So if the, if the pressure is very high, probably I would like to manage the pressure first and don't go into an MVG patient with, uh, with a cataract to do the cataract. But if possible, I, I would love to do them both. I, I will try to, to, to solve the problem because then we will have a patient with a dense cataract, which is going to get worse. And then we have to go into the surgery and that will maybe affect our, our implant or our functioning of the, of the, of the bleb of the, of the valve. So I will try to do combined surgery, yes. What do you think, Nate? You uh, combine, yeah, uh, yeah, I do. Particularly with Ahmed, I, you know. I, I but I, I can tell you that where uh, the, the cataract has no impact on how well the valve will work. It's just, you know, um, valves work as well as valves work. Period. It's hard, in fact, to find anything ECP, micropulse, uh, goniotomy. It's hard to make a valve better than it already is. So uh, I'll just add that I think the best glaucoma surgery is cataract surgery. Um, so in my, in my, uh, you know, opinion, almost everybody who has glaucoma should go for early cataract surgery because your, your care is much easier. Your options expand dramatically. Um, so two questions that are related, and maybe we can touch on these, uh, quickly here in the last few minutes that we have. Maria, do you ever, um, do you ever put the tube super tenon or the plate super tenons, or do you always go in for tenon, um, with your yeah, implants. I, I know my dear friend, George Tanaka's uh, super tenons uh, implant. Uh, no, I haven't done it really, uh, but, but I think it's smart and it's probably a, a nice way to deal with some things, but I, 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 I don't have experience with it. Yeah, Nate, have you played around with it? There are a lot of posts, you know, on AGSnet, Friedman, Tanaka talking about this and they're both, you know, excellent clinicians and I trust both of them. So do, do you yeah. do? You know, I guess if I were gonna do that, I'd be more likely to just do a tenectomy. Um, than, than to try to fiddle. It's not the easiest space to get into with a good dissection. Um, so I, I would be more inclined to just kind of get rid of the tenons above my tube and try to thin things out that way. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't do super tenons, and, and, but I have removed tenons when it's, when it's thick or if I'm worried about it. Um, there's a question here about what do you do with a scleral buckle in place? Uh, what's your technique? Let's say uh, you're going to do uh, glaucoma surgery, and there's a buckle in place. What's your decision making in that case, Maria, without being married to one device or the other? What do you think? Yeah, right. I usually leave the buckle in place. Uh, I try to put the implant on top of the buckle. And uh, if, if, if I see that it's very hard, uh, probably, and I, 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 I've, I've 
talked to with uh, about this with my retina colleagues and they say if you can you can cut the the little piece but i don't want to cut i don't i don't really want to cut it but yeah. i think i i have managed with uh, with putting mm. the the plate on top of the buckle yeah yeah you too nate yeah and in fact one time i did an almond valve and i didn't even realize the patient had a buckle <laughs> so you know, it, you know, the bottom line is if you sort of stay a little higher, maybe almost super teen on, you'll you'll in fact be able to just coast right over it. You'll notice extra scarring, but everything else can kind of be the same. Yeah. So just a couple of additions. Sometimes you can actually suture the eyelets to the uh, buckle. Uh, so it kind of it's a platform for you right there that delineates exactly where um, the plate's going to sit. Uh, and, and buckles are amenable to a needle going through, so easy enough. There's also the shocket procedure where you can just take a tube and put it into the capsule that's formed by the buckle itself. So that's your plate. Um, the, the buckle itself becomes your plate. You can just kind of open up the capsule around it and then sneak in a silicone tube. And it could be like the Ahmed extension uh, tube that uh, is separately packaged. So there are many ways to do it, but it doesn't prevent us from doing the surgery when a scleral buckle um, is present. Um, so some questions about sutures that we've already answered. Can we use the bar belt if there are large proline sutures at the equator post VR surgery? That's kind of the same question as a, as a, a buckle. So if there's something there, we can always work around it. What tube should we prefer in a case um, under, that has undergone a band buckle? Is there, would you pick a bar belt over the Ahmed um, in that case, Nate? Um, or would you still go with the Ahmed if the buckle is present? Uh, that is, you know, this brings us to a better, um, you know, more direct way to ask that question, which is how do you choose in general? And for me, I choose an Ahmed valve when the pressure is dramatically out of control and when seven weeks is too long to wait to get the pressure down for the health of the nerve. And um, I choose, you know, clear path or a bear belt when I've got time and I need a lower target. And, and so depending on that patient's situation, I, I would make the same choice. Okay. Do you feel the same way, Maria? Maria, what do you have access to? Which, um, okay. Okay. I, I think it's really important to state there are many, many options right now around the world. In the US, we basically have ClearPath, Barvelt, Ahmed, and uh, Maltino. Outside of the U.S., there's several others that um, are in from. There's the Paul device. There's um, there's a couple of others. There's the Ara Lab um, uh, device. Um, so a lot of these, I think, depends on your experience and and sort of um, uh, what you're comfortable in, and in many cases how you're actually trained. Um, so let's do one more question here. Um, do you, Nate, do you use a ripcord, and how do you decide whether you use a, a ripcord or not? I don't, I don't use one. Um, I, I'll let you uh, kind of speak to that. If I'm, um, if I'm interested in shorter term pressure reduction, I'll try, I will try something like Micropulse with my clear path, but I, I haven't uh, had, had good experiences in training uh, with rip cords and things like that. So I stayed away from it. Okay. And um, Maria, have, you said you use the AGV primarily, so you, you don't use a rip cord, of course, because of that. So the rip cord primarily is with the, uh, with the non-valved. And I also, I used it during fellowship and maybe for a year afterwards and realized that it really doesn't have a role in, in my practice. Um, so I'll do Sherwood slits um, in my, in my uh, non-valved devices. And um, that, that tends to help with control post-operatively and tie it off. But that's also a little bit of voodoo, um, how, how big the slits are, how many you do, do you use a needle or do you use, um, you know, some sort of a blade. Um, so there's, um, unfortunately, I, you know, I don't want to end here by saying that a lot of glaucoma surgery is voodoo, but it is. We know that a lot of what we do depends on our sort of our experience, our practice, who, who trained us. Uh, but more and more with a lot of these new devices, whether they're MIGS devices or these uh, new valves that we're getting our hands on, it's becoming more and more repeatable, reproducible. Uh, and I think our technique is also becoming more refined. I'm always excited to have a session like this where we can have an open discussion about our techniques. Maria, this is the first time you and I have been on a session like this. Um, I was excited to do this and I certainly learned a lot and I hope we can stay in touch and, and share notes on things and maybe do a session like this in the future. Uh, Nate, uh, you know, I've had more than enough of you. So yeah. this is probably the last time that we're gonna do a Zoom together. 
But I think your teachings and for the audience that's out there, I mean, if you want to see some unique and innovative techniques, if you go to Dr. Radcliffe's YouTube site, I think you're going to get a lot out of it. And I would encourage you to, to sign up for his YouTube channel so you can get the updates as he posts them. And then I also want to encourage you to go to CyberSite, look at the educational resources that are there. We have KEOGT.com on the CyberSite library. And please reach out to me on uh, Twitter or Instagram to let me know what you want future point-to-point um, um, sessions um, to cover and um, how we can make this better. So I want to thank uh, Maria and Nate again for your time. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Thanks again, guys. Thank you, Mal. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.